estimates on how much of communication is verbal versus nonverbal will vary from study to study. And there's no real way to say that it's this exact amount, but you know, there's some consensus that says it's probably around this, that 35% of communication is verbal and 65% is nonverbal. And it's easy to look at that and say, well, wow, nonverbal is so much more important than why do we even focus on, on verbal communication at all? But then uh, think about this. We've all had experiences where we've sent a text that's uh, that's gone wrong. We sent it to the wrong brain. That's that's verbal only, right? Verbal Just talking about the words. And, and so it can affect us in that way. When we send a text and we get wrong information that way or think about the the impact of a time when somebody's called you names. I mean, those are just words, right? They're just words. So what if somebody calls you a name, what? I mean, that has significant impact, right? Uh, and, and think about the difference as well between, uh, in one of the most famous songs of all time, Yesterday, uh, when Paul McCartney had the tune for that, but not the lyrics, he walked around saying scrambled eggs instead of yesterday. And what a difference that makes, right? I don't think that song would be as popular as it has become as, as you know, world renowned as it has become if it, if it had stuck with scrambled eggs instead of yesterday. Those words make a big difference difference. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about language. Let's, and we're going to start our conversation just by talking about the nature of language, some of the basic principles and things we need to know about language. Okay. The first thing we need to know is when we talk about language, language is words. That's what I mean. Verbal communication is words and language. That's what we're talking about here. Verbal communication is the same as language is the same as words. Really? That's, that's all it is. Verbal communication has to do with the words that we are using. So if we want to get technical language, the definition of language is a symbolic system of written or spoken words used to communicate messages. But in the end, you know, again, the easiest way to talk about it is verbal communication is language because verbal communication is words, whether that's spoken or written. We're talking just about the words though. That's it. The word themselves, not how we say them or who we say them to or anything else about that, but just the words that we choose, which is incredibly important. It's incredibly important, but we are limiting it to just the words themselves that we choose in that, in that circumstance. So let's talk a little bit about the nature of language or some of the basic principles or things we need to keep in mind about language. First of all, we need to remember that language is arbitrary and symbolic. It is completely random. Uh, language is completely random. That's what we mean by arbitrary. It is just made up. All language is just made up. It didn't come to us from on high somewhere. It is just things that somebody had in their mind and they said, boy, we need to really be able to say this in a certain way or write it down in a certain way. It's all just made up. It's arbitrary and it's symbolic in the fact that it just represents something else. So there's nothing magical about the actual symbols or characters that are used or, or anything uh, of that nature, but it, and they're just random, but they're also just representing something else. They're symbolic of something else. Like when we look at this, we see that the sign, you know, if you drive here in the United States, maybe you know what the sign means. It means that there are curves coming up, right? That's just a symbol that we use to communicate something quickly. Now that's not language. It's not a word, but still the idea that, that communication really is all symbolic and language in particular is symbolic. It represents something else. We use these characters and these words and these sentences and we build them out into paragraphs and things. And that is representing something else, uh, an idea or an object or whatever it is. So language is arbitrary. It's made up. It's, it's random. And then it's, it's symbolic. It just represents other things. Now within that, we know that words have different types of meaning though, because words are made up and they're symbolic. People can come to different uh, understandings of them. So we all words have two kinds of meaning. The first is a denotative meaning, which we sometimes refer to as like the dictionary meaning of a word, right? So, um, what we mean by that is just, if we were to look up whatever word it is in the dictionary, what would it say there? And we can all agree on that, then, right? We all agree that the denotative meaning is technically what that word is or what that word uh, means in a literal sense, in a denotative sense. Okay. That's the one meaning of a word, but all words also have a different kind of meaning. They have that denotative meaning. Sometimes we hide behind that and say, well, no, technically it means this, but really it can also mean other things too, right? Which is where we come up with this idea of a, a, what we call a connotative meaning, which is that meaning that exists in our minds. Every person is going to have their own, you know, interpretation or, or different shades of meaning for a particular word. That connotative meaning is more subjective because it does, it lives in our mind and that's it, right? The connotative meaning exists in our mind. So the denotative meaning is we can all agree on it. We're all on the same page, literally on the same page of the dictionary, whatever that word is, that's the denotative meaning. 
But then we also have this connotative meaning. What does that word mean to me? And what do I feel when I hear that word? And uh, what does it make me think of? And, you know, all those things come into to play in the connotative meaning. Okay. So to give you an example, um, two researchers, uh, communication scholars named Ogden and Richards came up with what they call the semantic triangle, right? And the semantic triangle, you're going to be amazed by this. It is a literal triangle, right? Denotatively, it is a triangle. So uh, the semantic triangle that Ogden and Richards came up with this idea to kind of help explain this first. So you have the actual word itself, right? You have the actual word, which is this, I'm just using the word home as an example here. So we have this, again, it's arbitrary, it's symbolic, but we have these characters that we put together, H-O-M-E. We, in English anyway, we say it at home, at least where I'm at, we call it, we say home. And, uh, and so the home is the literal word itself. It's just those, that collection of characters, right? H-O-M-E in that specific order for me means home. Now, uh, then we have the denotative meaning of the word home, which, you know, in the case that I'm working on, was, it's like this building, right? It's a building where people live. It's usually a domicile where people live, at least, in, again, in, in where I live in my culture, it is, uh, it's going to have walls and a door and it's going to probably have a yard and it's going to, so, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a structure though where people live, where you would go to sleep and maybe to eat and watch TV and do whatever. That's your home, right? That's your home. But then we also have this other kind of connotative meaning, uh, which for many people, when you say home, home is not the building where they live, right? Home is where you're at with the people that you love. Home is wherever your heart is, wherever your family is, wherever, you know, if you're a parent, what's where your kids are, that's your home. It doesn't matter. Our kids are grown and gone. It doesn't matter. This is their home as far as I'm concerned, right? Now, they may think otherwise of, of you know, but when I think of that, when they say coming home, I think they're talking about here. Um, which would be a long trip for some of them, but, um, if they were coming here, but, uh, but this is home. The home to me is, is where my family's at, not this building that I live in, this, which I, which is fantastic, but, um, but it's not home for me. Home is wherever my family is, wherever the people I love are at. But other people may look at this and have that same thing. We think of the word home, right? And denotatively, we may be on the same page. May, may, I mean, we should be on the same page thinking about, okay, home is technically a structure, but when they think of home, some people didn't have a great home experience. So home to them is, is not a great place. It's not a great feeling, not a great thing, not something to be desired. If you're going there and, pe and there's a constant fighting or there's, you know, something else going on there. So home to them has an entirely different meaning, right? I've worked with young people people um, for many, many years now. And uh, some of them, you know, you say, oh, it's time to go home. And they're, they're like, great. Okay. It's fan fantastic. I, I, I'm happy to go home because it's a wonderful place. But you say to some of them, it's time to go home. And they're like, eh, do I have to? I mean, is there someplace else I can go for a while? Can I just hang out here for a while? Or, you know, can I, can I mop the floors or something so that I don't have to go home? I mean, they have a different meaning of that word home. Home is not a fantastic meaning for them. So that's the connotative meaning of that word for them. It's different shades of meaning for different people. So one last example here, just real quickly. We took the word baseball. Again, the word itself is just this collection of letters in this particular order. Um, denotatively, we know that baseball is two things. Baseball is both the game, the sport, right? And as, you know, rules uh, that, that, you know, so there's a batter and there's three strikes and four balls and, and that kind of thing, nine innings, whatever. That's baseball. But then also the actual baseball itself, the physical baseball, those are denotatively. Whether you like baseball, you don't like baseball, that that's what it is, right? It is the game and it is that ball. But, you know, then we can all have different connotative meanings. So if I, if I were to go around and ask anybody watching this, what do you think when you think of baseball, you get a lot of different answers. And I've done this in a lot of different classes and I do get a lot of different answers, right? I get a lot of answers about, you know, baseball is going and watch my kids play in little league or having to sit in the bleachers or pick them up or whatever. Baseball is my favorite team, um, winning games or winning the world series or whatever it is. Um, baseball, some people are like, baseball is boring. I don't like baseball. So, I mean, it brings up different things for different people. That's the connotative meaning of that word. Then. So whether again, you like baseball or don't like baseball, you theoretically, if you, if you speak English and you, and you understand the word itself, you would, you would recognize that collection of letters as the word baseball denotatively, again, regardless of your feelings about it, denotatively, we know the denotative meaning of that word is the game and the ball. And then connotatively though, that's where we see all this divergence about what baseball means to people and what feelings it brings up for people. Okay. So we need to keep in mind that, that language is arbitrary and it is symbolic. It is really just made up and it is symbolic of things, but it does incorporate these different meanings 
for people. Okay? Every word is going to have a different meaning um, for the person that you're, you're, you're that is hearing it. Okay. okay. Uh, next up, language has rules. Uh, there are rules to, to every language. Now, those rules are different from language to language, but there are there are rules um, for language, and every 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 language has them. So. We're not going to get into great detail, but these are some of the different kinds of rules that you will see with languages. Um, so you have like phonological rules, um, which has to do with the pronun the production and the pronunciation of those words. Again, if you grew up, you know, in my era, you you probably studied you learned words through what we call phonics, which is based on that we learned by sound. You would sound words out you, when you're reading. The teacher would say, "Now sound it out, sound it out," and so we would learn by sounding things out and recognizing that. Oh, when I see these this collection of uh, letters, it makes this sound or whatever. But that that's the phonological rule of language, right? How do we pronounce these these letters? And when you have this collection of letters, what's what sound does it make? So the production and the pronunciation of those words is the or you know have to do with the phonological rules. Every language also has syntactic rules, which has to do with things like the structure of the sentences and how do we use punctuation, and that's syntax. And so every language has syntactic rules as well. Every language has what we call semantic rules, which has to do with the meaning of words. So the meaning of words has to do with semantics. So again, language is arbitrary. It's made up, but we have to agree on what do we mean when we say this word? What is the meaning of that word? That's semantics. And that's where we come up with the meaning of those words. And we come to some shared understanding of what that word uh, means and what it should bring to mind for people when they hear that word. And then you have pragmatic rules, which is really just how, what we would call kind of language in context or how those words and how that language is used on a daily um, basis. Um, and it, it, sometimes pragmatic rules go against some of these other rules in a way that, 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 that may not make much sense, but it's understood by everybody, right? So how do we use that language on a on a day to day basis um, and, and the utility of the, that language in practice uh, comes from pragmatic rules. Okay? So those are just some examples of the different kinds of rules that you have. But the bottom line is language has rules. If you have a language, there have to be rules that can be understood. And that's how we learn those rules. And every language has different kinds of rules and things, but, but every language has rules. Um, the next thing we need to understand about language is that it evolves, right? Language evolves um, in the same way that, you know, you, you, you have, you know, the evolution of organisms or whatever, and, and maybe even people over time, right? So, um, but language evolves and changes in the same way. It does not stay the same. Language changes um, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So um, we could look back at the history of um, different languages, like, for example, if we're looking for where English came from, well, it, you know, come originated really from West Germanic uh, languages. And then you see the division there between those and then on down the line through Old English, Middle English, till we get to English. Um, so, but you can see on this chart that though at, the, at, at its root, English shares the same, if we go back far enough, the same root as Frisian, as Low German, as Dutch, as Afrikaans, as German, and as uh, uh, Yiddish even, right? So um, they all kind of stem from the same language if you go back far enough, right? Because these languages have evolved based on um, where people are living and what mixture of cultures you have there, and then we bring in new words. And uh, But we can see it even in our own culture today. If we were to look back at just even the pop slang of the 2000s, for example, it's so, so not forever ago. I mean, this is in the same century here. The pop slang of the 2000s, you can see here in this chart, there are a lot of different uh, words that we just don't even use anymore, really. It's bound um, by the context of that culture, um, and 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 it uh, it has evolved since then. We've evolved away from um, some of these. Some of these are still around. I mean, you'll occasionally see LOL or something like that, um, but we don't really we don't really say bootylicious a whole lot anymore. Uh, you don't hear people say awesome sauce that much, which is too bad because I like that one. Um, you know. And we just don't use a lot of these. So language changes. We bring in new words and then they go out of style and some words stay and some words go. But language evolves over time. English and languages like it are what we call living language. So these are languages that will continue to evolve and grow and change. And that's how they stay current. That's why Latin is considered what we call a dead language, because it'll never change again. 
it's that whatever you have in Latin now is what will, what it will be a hundred years from now because nobody uses it. Nobody changes it. Nobody does anything. So, um, it's a dead language, but English and, and other current languages are living languages. They evolve, they change, they grow. Um, and, and, uh, so, um, that's, that's just part of what happens with a contemporary living language. Okay, so now you have a little better idea of the basics of, the nature of language. Hopefully you have an appreciation for that and we can then get into some uh, higher level uh, concepts in other videos, but we need to start here with the foundation of what language is and why it's important. So hopefully this video has, has provided that for you. If you have questions about, about the nature of language or anything else related to verbal communication or other types of communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will continue to pursue your understanding of language and and increase your your appreciation for how important language really is in our communication